right, so our next style in architecture is postmodernism. I do think it's important, though, that we go back and review just a little bit. Um, this is the next house that we're going to be looking at by Robert Venturi. Um, but just to recap um, briefly, so in terms of um, 20th century architecture, um, some important architects to think about are obviously Plank. Frank Lloyd Wright, um, the Roby House, in particular the prairie style architecture. And it's really important to remember that with early 20th century architecture, um, it is really marked by a complete embrace of technological advances. Um, Faro concrete construction, particularly in Europe, allowed for new designs employing skeletal frameworks and glass walls, which we saw also with um, Louis Sullivan's work. Um, with his, his skyscraper, the, the, the Prescott um, building. Um, and it allowed for new designs employing skeletal frameworks and glass walls. Um, we can see the cantilever is an important um, convention which helped push building elements beyond the solid structural of the skeletal framework, and we see that with Frank Lloyd Wright's works. In general, architects avoided historical associations. So again, this idea of an American style Frank Lloyd Wright, in particular, this organic architecture, and also the idea of a Usonian home, which really meant an American home, sort of inspired by sort of the wide open spaces of, um, of um, America. Um, there are few columns and fewer flying buttresses. Architects prefer clean, sleek lines that stress the building's underlying structure and emphasize the impact of machine and technology, which we, we did see. So just to review Frank Lloyd Wright's Robbie House um, and also the Kaufman House, Falling Water, um, which is probably his most famous work. Um, in terms of the international style, Le Corbusier um, and his Villa Savoy um, is, is an important. Um, and remember, they each of these architects sort of have a phrase. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, you know, this idea of organic architecture, um, Louis Sullivan, um, in the late 19th century with um, his um, pre-Scott building, you know, this idea of form follows function. And Le Corbusier, um, a machine for the living, which we saw with, with his house and his, con you know, this, this house or villa he constructed. Um, and, and then in particular with um, Mize, I mean, get to that slide in a second. Hold on. So the architect um, Mize, Van der Rohe, and the Seagram building, um, we see this idea of less is more. So hopefully those phrases, again, might um, help you sort of keep these different styles um, um, differentiated from one another. So now getting into postmodernism. Um, postmodern architects generally thought, was generally thought to have emerged in the late 1970s and early 1980s, um, and it, it really sees the achievements of the international style as um, cold and removed from the needs of modern cities with their cosmopolitan populations. Postmodernists um, see nothing wrong with incorporating ornament, traditional architecture expressions and references to past styles in a modern context. Um, Philip Johnson himself, a contributor to the international style, as well as someone who worked on the Seagram building um, began to shift away to a postmodern ideal um, um, in, in his work. And so, and this is very common, we see these different movements, you know, come in and out. We see, uh, you know, the prior movement embracing a certain convention, and then we see the movement coming after that sort of, you know, sort of disassociating themselves and maybe looking back to the past. So here we see with postmodernism, perhaps this return um, you know, to not completely stripping down a building and, and just emphasizing its simplicity and, and geometric form, but also incorporating um, some ornament. Um, as with, with this case, we definitely can see that in um, this house designed by Robert Ventura, um, known as the House in Newcastle, um, located in, the, um, in Delaware. So with his um, Newcastle country house, um, Ventura offers a modest but instructive example of the postmodern style set um, in the rural North Delaware. Um, he was an influential teacher and theorist. Um, Ventura studied architecture at Princeton University 
then attended the American Academy in Rome during the mid-1950s, where he developed a, um, a, a partiality towards post-Renaissance architecture, um, particularly works built in the Mannerist and Baroque periods in Italy. Um, in 1966, um, the Museum of Modern Art in New York published his first book, um, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, written while he was teaching at the University in Pennsylvania. It contains dozens of small black and white photographs of Western architecture from ancient times to the present day, as well as examples of architects um, of his um, early work. So you can see here definitely the some of these structures should seem familiar. So, you know, I, I think in, in a lot of ways he he can be compared to the architect um, Le Corbusier, um, where he, you know, in some ways sort of tried to look at um, the universal, the universality of um, certain conventions in architecture, where he also looked back at older buildings like the Parthenon, um, and, you know, in addition to other design forms um, associated with technology like cars and steamships and things like that. So um, Venturi, in his first chapter in his book, um, which was subtitled A Dental Manifesto, um, expressed his strongly held belief that orthodox modern architecture and city planning had run its course. Um, instead, he wanted... Um, to kind of move away from the disciplined and austere footsteps of European architects like Le Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe. Um, Le Corbusier did the, um, the Villa Sovi, um, and uh, Mies van der Rohe did the Seagram's building. Um, and so he highlighted historic, structure, historic structure, structures that exhibited what he called a messy vitality over obvious unity. And so this is an inclusion of a, of a column or an engaged capital um, that is you know, part of the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul that was um, under the Emperor Justinian. Um, and so in his book, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, um, it was well received by contemporary critics, um, particularly Yale University professor Vincent Scully, who wrote in the introduction that Venturi presented a fresh approach to looking at architecture, preferring complexi complexity and contradiction over abstraction of, of what Venturi called the, the fairy stories of modernist purity. Um, he followed up the, marvis, the marvis, marvelously titled Learning from Las Vegas, um, co-authored in 1972 with his wife and partner, Denise Scott Brown, um, and really highlighted, and this book highlighted the way buildings are experienced from a distance while traveling along um, the gaudy sunset, sunset strip. For Venturi, how, how, a building looks, um, how a building looks and are perceived was far more important than the techniques and systems and theories used to plan and construct them. So he's really... In a lot of ways, I guess, thinking about the, the viewer and, and, you know, the initial idea of, of the first impression of the building, perhaps um, to a viewer, um, you know, encountering the structure. So this is another house designed by Venturi, um, known as the Vanna Venturi House in Pennsylvania. So it's a little bit earlier, it dates from 1961 through 64. The Newcastle House, which is this house that we're going to talk about, um, dates to an important period in Venturi's career in postmodernism. Um, though some of his peers designed buildings that respectfully imitate the past, he was no he wasn't a revivalist. Rather than copy a specific style, he borrowly, he borrowed freely juxtaposing, collaging, and reinterpreting forms from distinct periods and places. Um, this was particularly true in the Vanna Venturi house that you see here. Um, built in the Philadelphia suburbs, this famous house is located at the end of a driveway and, res and resembles a child's drawing. Um, viewed through the lens of classicism and 1960s pop art, his witty design incorporated a large gable, a recessed porch, and noticeably an off-centered um, chimney. Um, 
So here we're getting into this idea of the American vernacular. Um, the Newcastle House um, was built for a family of three and sits comfortably in nature. And so here are some sources. In contrast to Andre Palladio's Villa Rotunda, which I have talked about before, um, I, ha I haven't talked about it um, as a specific work, but I have used it in comparison um, to talking about other architects. Um, this was on your last quiz, I think, um, and some of you missed um, this. So please go back and look at Andrea Pal um, Palado and um, his Villa Rotunda. It's a really important building. Um, this was one that I cited with Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. And a lot of you got that wrong on the last test. Um, or Le Cabossure's Villa um, Savoy. Um, it, it neither crowns a hilltop nor hovers above a, above a well-trimmed lawn. Instead, the house sits surrounded by rolling fields beside a thickly wooded forest. So let me get back to the house so you can see. Um, like many traditional American farmhouses and barns, the painted siding is white and the intersecting gables um, are clad with unstained wood shingles. Um, it may look conventional and familiar, but on a closer inspection, the exterior is enlivened by a diverse array of mischievous and sometimes perplexing architectural features. Here we can see a sketch of um, the Venturi um, Newcastle House. Um, of particular interest is how Venturi treated the front and rear facades of the structure. Um, in Learning from Las Vegas, the authors celebrated the concept of the decorated shed, buildings that exploit easily recognizable two-dimension elements to generate a visual interest and meaning. Um, so the front facade of the Newcastle um, house incorporates a floating arched screen that, like a highway billboard, rises somewhat awkwardly from the lower edge of the gable above. Um, though Ventura claimed this curved feature had Austrian Baroque origins, like a garden gate or eyebrow dormers found on some Victorian houses, its function, it functions as a sign. Um, identifying the structure as a residence. Furthermore, since the owners enjoyed bird watching, it may have also doubled as a blind um, camouflage, as a blind camouflage, camouflaging the, the a blind, like a, a blind that you close, um, camouflaging the large windows behind it. So it is a rather kind of quirky sort of architectural feature, sort of included on what appears to be in some ways a traditional looking house. The rear facade is even more curious and complex. While it too is dominated by a prominent arched um, screen, the screen is framed by the edges of the gabled roof, supported by what appears to be a Doric um, colonnade. It's kind of a faux Doric colonnade. Um, the four stubby columns are in fact almost flat, thin as the outer walls. These cutouts carry little weight and enclose the recessed porch. While the column on the far right grows seamless, seamlessly out of the adjoining wall, the left column appears split in half by the addition of an aluminum um, drain pipe. Classical in um, derivation, yet slightly cartoonish. So it is. it does sort of look like that. It looks like sort of a classical, I mean, they're classical features, but sort of done in this caricature or sort of cartoonish way. And it, and it really does sort of, the back in particular really resembles this kind of sketch that that does look um, in some ways like a child um, did it. Um, so there is a sort of arc awkwardness um, in terms of how the house is assembled, um, but it gives it, a, I think, a sort of grand sort of um, whimsical appearance, and, and which can be very charming, I think. And so here is the interior, which again, I think you can sort of see these sort of flat sort of cutouts. Um, this is a, a music room in the Newcastle house. In photographs dating from the time of the building's completion, the spacious interiors appear simple and comfortable with wood decorations inspired by various 19th century design traditions. The painted arches in the vaulted music room um, the quirky chandeliers and perforated wall patterns exhibit a straightforward craftsman-like quality, 
as if cut by hand or a jigsaw. Conspicuously two-dimensional, their fanciful silhouettes evoke um, the carpenter Gothic and Queen Anne styles. Uh, Venturi never liked um, the stylistic term postmodern, but his building and critical writings helped propel the late 20th century architecture into a new direction. This private residence remains a playful, challenging work expressing a, expressing a refreshing pluralist, pluralistic, or and that means a multi, multiple view of architecture and design. All right, so now we're moving into high-tech architecture. Um, this is the building we're going to be looking at, Frank O'Gary, um, the Solomon Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. Before we do that, though, we are going to be looking at um, some other museum designs, and we are also going to be taking a look at Frank Lloyd Wright Solomon um, Guggenheim Museum in New York City. Um, so prior to the mid-20th century, art museums in Europe and the United States were mostly designed in variants of the neoclassical style. So you definitely can see that here with um, this, this, um, the, the facade of the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., done by John Russell Pope. So what we see, um, you know, during this sort of period or this sort of neoclassical revival are large and small cultural institutions um, commissioning um, state, stately stone structures distinguished by the sort of, you know, typical sort of um, temple facade, the pedimented um, 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 fronts, the, the long colonnades, and, and these sort of lofty rotundas and domes, um, axial and processional um, exhibition galleries were traditionally arranged in rows with understood decorative treatments that um, complemented the artwork. Um, what is a pediment colonnade and rotunda? Um, just to, to remind you, uh, a pediment is a triangular gable often found above um, columns derived from ancient Greek and Roman architecture. Um, a colonnade is a row of columns. And a rotunda is a building with a circular plan or in this case, a room often with a circular plan within a larger building, and it's usually covered by a dome. So I thought it was important to review those, um, those um, architectural elements. So um, in 1959, um, um, the Solomon um, R. Guggenheim Museum um, was created, and we can see it's, it's definitely much different um, than the neoclassical revival building uh, that we see with the National Gallery in DC. Um, it had this sort of spiraling concrete ramps. Um, it was one of the first museums to challenge this traditional facade of um, a museum. By the 1980s, um, it had outgrown its Frank Lloyd Wright um, designed Fifth Avenue home in New York above and Thomas Krenz, the museum's director, began developing plans to expand the museum's reach um, through an establishment of sort of satellite branches of museums um, funded by foreign governments. Um, so essentially this, this, this structure became, you know, is, is small. It's in New York City and it couldn't be expanded. So they came up with this idea of creating these sort of satellite museums related to the Guggenheim Museum in different um, countries. So here, when we look at um, Frank Lloyd Wright's um, Guggenheim Museum in New York City, we do kind of get this idea of going with the flow. Um, he really drew layouts um, with this idea of continuity in mind so that wall ceilings and floors flowed seamlessly around um, just as rooms merge with each other. Um, and so it wasn't compartmentalized um, as, you, as you would think, as you would see with a, a sort of um, structure like this um, from the National Gallery. Um, Wright wanted no posts, no columns, because the new reality, he said, is space instead of matter. Um, and, and then, you know, again, a lot of the international style architects sort of borrowed these concepts. Um, so let's get to the structure. Um, so um, among the projects um, that were proposed for these different sort of satellite museums in different countries, um, was this project, um, the 1997 branch um, in, Bilbao, in Bilbao, Spain. Um, it has been the most highly regarded um, of all the, the projects um, 
related to um, the Guggenheim Museum. Not only does it provide the Guggenheim with a larger exhibition venue for the 20th century and contemporary art, but it shifted the direction of museum design. At this point in his prolific career, Frank Gehry had a number of cultural institutions to his credit and was developing an international reputation for producing consistently innovative work. He was born in Toronto, Canada in 1929, um, and then he sort of based um, a lot of his work in Los Angeles um, and received a prestigious um, Pritzker Architecture Prize in 1989. So important early projects by, um, by him, which include um, the Ventra Design Museum, um, in 1989, you can see here, and I, I definitely think you can see sort of a similar style and how he's sort of applied some similar construction techniques to the Bilbao Museum in, um, in Spain. All right, so here's a floor plan. Um, so the Guggenheim Bilbao was also part of an ambitious um, urban renewal program conceived by the Basque regional government. Um, an aging port and industrial center, the city had entered a period of significant economic decline during the 1980s. Various well-known architects were invited to design new structures, including Santiago Caltrava from Spain and um, Norman Foster from England. Through initial discussion, though initial discussions focused on converting an um, existing industrial structure into an art museum, Cranes conceived, a local, conceived local officials to provide a more central and flexible location, a site on the banks of um, the Neveron River. So we'll do some comparisons um, to the Guggenheim and the Bilabala Museum. Um, comparisons to the Guggenheim Museum in New York would be inevitable. Um, Kranz um, urged um, Gary to make it better um, than Wright's version. Um, and the Bilbao Museum recalls the earlier building in very subtle ways. So again, he's, he's alluding, um, here you have a younger architect sort of alluding to um, sort of a master architect, but also sort of venturing off and, and creating um, his own style as well. From the absence of historical reference to the focus on a central rotunda or atrium, um, you know, these are things that he's included. Um, Bill Boa did it on a much larger scale. So really in comparison, this museum is, is quite, um, the Guggenheim in New York in scale is quite small compared to this structure. Um, so he's sort of, sort of doing, um, I think what the Manners did with high Renaissance artists, you know, they took what they learned from those artists and tried to make it bigger and better and, and a little different. Um, so it's really not an uncommon um, progression that we see with artists, um, you know, in particular, you know, older artists and then younger artists um, um, following them. So um, again, he, he sort of um, takes a lot of some of the similar um, architectural elements that Wright included um, and just kind of you know, did them on a much larger and grander scale. Both architects produced unrestrained modern spaces of great architectural force and energy. So again, just to give you a sense of the Guggenheim Museum. And again, it is kind of squished in there. And then the interior itself is really important. So again, it's such a different experience than going into some of these other museums where you know, the work, you, you just kind of go up the spiral and, you know, the work is displayed on these, these curved walls. But then there's some classical elements too, where you do have the dome and this sort of oculus. Um, it's really beautiful too, the way the, in, you know, different times of the day, the patterning um, from the window and the light coming through create um, these different patterns. All right. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, Gary, who started his career in the 1960s, developed a personal aesthetic gradually, discovering exhilarating ways to shatter and reassemble architectural forms. So I think that's a good way to think about it, um, how he kind of shattered and reassembled maybe traditional forms. 
Um, as most architects do, he began with um, the structure's most basic program. After determining the size and shape of the interiors, he melded the forms together, arranging them into lively sculptural holes. Um, through his early work, though his early work is sometimes categorized as deconstructivism, featured everyday building materials like chain link, um, congruted metal, and plywood. By the late 1980s, Gary had refined his vision using more costly surfaces to produce unexpected sensual designs, which I think you can see here with this, this very um, sleek sort of metal material. Um, aided by sophisticated computer software, his most dated, daring projects evoked aspects of Italian Baroque style. And remember, Baroque style was all about drama um, and theatrics, and so I definitely think you can see that um, in particular with this structure, but just done in a modern way. Like the drapery folds that um, animate some pieces of the 17th century figurative sculpture, Gary's more striking works juxt juxtapose elements that bend, rippled, um, and, and, and sort of move together. And so here is a, a probably a computerized um, sketch, and, and you really do get a sense of the sort of complexity and, and the movement of these buildings um, um, that he was trying to achieve. Um, this is a pretty unusual view. We're, we're mostly used to seeing um, the view of the, 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 this is the typical view or the postcard view of the museum. It's interesting to see it from, from this perspective. So most photographs depict the Guggenheim um, Bilbao from across the river. Although this view is arguably the most dramatic and satisfying, the main entrance is on the opposite side of the building at the front of a narrow residential street. And so it is kind of interesting to sort of see it sort of pop up, you know, amongst this sort of older, more traditional street. Um, you kind of get a glimpse of it. And again, it's interesting, too, because you have this really high-tech architecture in contrast with the landscape above it. So we'll look at some interior views. Arriving this, when um, arriving visit visitors cross over concealed railroad tracks and descend through a broad stepped limestone plaza pa pla passing from a slender notch into a soaring 165 foot atrium which you're looking at now um, a complex and somewhat chaotic interior this twisting glass and steel volume combines irregularly shaped lines limestone and plaster walls um, glazed elevator shafts and vertigo inducing catwalks vertigo is sort of um, the a feeling of dizziness, um, especially people who are afraid of heights or as they move upward might get dizzy. Definitely, I think when you see some of these views, you can get that sense or <laughs> feeling. Um, the central atrium um, serves as a circular hub and orientation gallery, providing access to the approximately 20 galleries on three levels. While the, se the sequence of classical galleries are predictably rectangular, Rectangular, other exhibition spaces have surprising shapes with angled or curving walls and occasional balconies. Particularly memorable is the so-called boat gallery. Um, we'll look at that. Um, though Gary um, compares the shape to a fish, a reincurring motif in his work, this enormous column-free column-free space, which is what you're looking at here. Um, extends more than 400 feet along the riverfront promenade and beneath um, the adjoining bridge. Ideal for large works of sculpture, this vast space contains an installation by Richard Sierra. And here it is, um, the snake. So we'll be looking at the work of Richard Sierra later when we look at more contemporary artwork. So I know it seems like this is not, this is, this is this sort of brown sort of um, ribbon sculpture is um, Richard Sierra's work. But it does fit nicely with sort of the, the, the round sort of curvy elements of um, Gary's interior of the, of the museum. And it does, I mean, honestly, it, now that I look at it, it really does look like a boat or a ship. I mean, the museum itself, like a, a big sort of modernized um, steamship.
Um, so again, with this idea of, of modern architecture, it really is different. Um, we, we with um, this introduction of um, of this type of building, um, and it really changed a lot in the 1980s, um, especially with the with the idea of the computer. I mean, that's another important element. I think that probably a structure like this could not exist without sort of the um, ability of the computer to help the architects sort of really come up with these very complex um, designs. So no longer are blueprints painstakingly drawn by hand to exacting specifications. Programs like AutoCAD and MicroStation not only assist in drawing ground plans, but um, automatically checking for errors. And so it made these structures, which you know, probably mathematically would have been really difficult um, to to kind of predict um, possible errors or things that could go wrong much easier. Um, and making these sort of um, grand structures um, a reality. So um, the Guggenheim um, Bill Bala opened to the public in 1997. The reception to Gary's unorthodox Unorthodox design was not nothing less than ecstatic, drawing international acclaim from um, fellow architects and critics as well as from tourists who, um, who had come all the way from different parts of the world um, to view it. Um, the New York Times architectural critic called the undulating structure a miracle. Um, the benefit to the city's local economy was immediate and substantial. And numerous cities have tried, but not always succeeded, to patch or to match its, its success. Um, commissioning similarly dynamic structures um, from high profile, um, what they call star architects. You know, like, you know, I talked about art stars, so these architects, but they're sort of star architects. So, like, Frank Lloyd Wright, obviously, Franco Gehry would, would be in that, um, in that um, realm. And so, just I know I didn't mention this, I should have, but the, the metal that is being used is titanium and, and Gary's structure. All right, so we are moving on to our last um, structure. This is also a museum. Um, and so this is, this is actually 21st century, um, but I just wanted to include it um, with all the architecture because it just makes sense to sort of build upon it. Um, and so this is um, the Maxi... Um, Italian. Um, it's an Italian museum. Um, the Museum Nationale della of Art. Um, um, 21st, uh, you know, um, century. So it's basically a, a museum that um, exhibits um, 21st century art and only that. Um, so it's a National Museum of Contemporary Art and Architecture. Um, it is located in Rome. Um, and it was designed by, um, as a multi multidisciplinary space by Zaha Hadid, um, and who was an architect, I believe, from Iraq, um, who was very committed to experimentation and innovation in the arts and architecture. So um, the design of Zaha Hadid was the winner of an international design competition that was held. The site of the new museum was that of a disused military compound, um, which was known as the former Casamara Montalo. The competition proposal by Sahad Hadid envisioned the construction of five new structures, only one of which has been actually built. So um, the building is a composition of blending um, move to another view. I like to show it at different times of the day of, of sort of bending these sort of oblong um, tubes and it has this sort of overlapping, intersecting and piling of these different um, th these different tubes on top of each other resembling sort of a piece of, of massive transport infrastructure. I mean it does. It almost it kind of looks like a, an airport in a lot of ways. Um, um, the structure of the new building um, of the museum is composed of curved sidewalls made of self-consolidating um, concrete. Um, the horizontal structure are mostly made of black painted steel profiles, sometimes clad with fiber-reinforced concrete panels um, to reinforce it. 
Um, and so the, the, the museum consists, the structure of the complex consists of two museums, one devoted to art and one devoted to architecture. In addition to the two museums, it also features an auditorium, a library, and a media library specializing in art and architecture. It also has a bookshop, a cafeteria, a bar restaurant, um, galleries for temporary exhibitions, um, performances, educational activities as well. Um, the large public square designed in front of the museum is planned to host um, artworks as well as live events. So again, it really is a, a very multifunctional structure. Um, designed as a true multidisciplinary and multi-purpose campus of the arts and culture, um, the structure creates an urban complex for the city that can be enjoyed by all. In addition to the two museums that um, um, the structure offers, um, Again, it, it really, you know, it's not just a museum, it's, it's really sort of a cultural site that, you know, is intended for everyone, you know, not just the elite um, or the aristocrats, but um, is, is meaningful and, and can be used by all the citizens. So here's the interior view, which again is, you know, again, we see the sort of undulating and bending of these sort of tubular forms. The main concept of the project is directly linked to the purpose of the building as a center for the exhibition of visual art. The walls that cross the space and their intersections um, defines interiors and, and exterior spaces of the museum. The system acts on all three levels of the building, the second of which is more complex with a wealth of connections with various bridges that link buildings and galleries. So you, you do, you kind of have these different bridges that sort of link these, um, these different spaces together. Um, the, visitors, the, the visitor is invited to enter into a series of continuous spaces rather than the compact volume of an isolated building. So the fluid and sinuous shapes, the variety of interweaving of spaces, and the modulated use of natural light led to a spatial functioning framework of a great complexity, offering constantly changing and unexpected views from within the building and outdoor spaces. Two principal architectural elements characterize the project, the concrete walls that define the exhibition galleries and determine the interweaving of volumes, and the transparent roof that modulates natural light. Now that's really important too. So when we think about some of these, um, you know, older church structures, you know, this idea of dark, you know, churches, you know, that's sort of out. We want, you know, light was very important. Um, and and again, this sort of goes back to maybe Gothic architecture where, you know, with the use of stained glass and, and these sort of windows of glass. But, you know, this open space and this light-filled space is, is very modern and, and really characteristic of 20th or 21st century architecture. The roofing system compiles with um, the highest standards required for museums. Um, it is composed of integrated frames and um, louvers, which um, to, which are devices for filtering sunlight, artificial light, and environmental control. So in addition to the actual transparency of the roof, they also have these sort of different um, filters um, that maybe correct the sort of light coming in, um, you know, light that, you know, a filter used to maybe help you, um, you know, artwork. Um, so that's interesting, too, how they're sort of playing around with the, with the light coming through, and, and that is just as much uh, of a function or element of the work or the structure itself. Look at some other views. So um, the two museums, the one devoted to art and the other to architecture, are located around a large full height, full height space which gives access to the galleries dedicated to permanent collections and temporary exhibitions. The auditorium, reception surfaces, cafeteria and bookshops. Outside a pedestrian walkway follows the outline of the building restoring an urban link that has been blocked for almost a century by the former military barracks. So that's also important. So it kind of reconnected this structure, this military structure that wasn't really part of the city um, and sort of unifies it again as more of a civic space that is, is to be used by, by everyone and all the citizens. The interior spaces defined by the exhibition walls are covered by glass, a glass roof that um, flood the galleries with natural light again filtered by these sort of louvered lines of, of roofing beams. Um, these beams underline the linearity 
of um, the spatial system and aid in articulating the various ornament orientations of the galleries and facilitate circular circulation through the museum and campus. So that's kind of a good way to think about it. It's sort of a campus uh, for the arts. And I just, I love this drawing. Um, you know, it's a very simple sort of mark making, but it really does sort of capture the fluidity of, of the design um, that um, Hadid um, incorporated. All right. So, I think that's it. <laughs> um, architecture is not my strong suit, so I hope um, some of these things um, made sense to you. Again, please always um, review the Khan Academy videos um, that I upload for you guys as well um, to help better explain um, and, and also give you, you know, because a lot of these buildings, it's hard to look at um, in two-dimensional images, but I think when you see a, a video, they, they're able to sort of give you a better sense of the space as well. All right, so um, good luck, and I hope you, in addition to finishing this, that you also have a good spring break. I'm sorry I had to give you some work over the break, but we really needed to get through this material. All right, well, I will see you soon. Bye.